Good morning, everyone. If you'd like to take your seats, we're going to start. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have three uh, wonderful uh, speakers, and uh, that will be followed by a conversation and then open for a Q&A. So we will jump right into it, and Nura, we invite you, you would like to go, yes? Nura will start, and then um, Primesh and Khalil. Thank you for joining us. Marhaba, Masa Noor. Um, I'm really honored to be here and mostly thrilled that I got to witness Professor Gatri Spivak in person and now to share this uh, panel alongside you. Unlike the inimitable uh, Professor Spivak, I am not a professor of the humanities, though I'm equally committed to changing our conception of the human and who belongs in it. I am a legal scholar, so this will in some ways be slightly more systematic. Um, I'm also a horrible lawyer in the sense that I, I rage against the law as a structure of oppression and try to still find ways within that oppression uh, to use it to advance our emancipatory potential and purpose. So with that, thanks to a series of Israeli human rights organizations concluding that Israel oversees an apartheid regime between 2021 and 2022, these years have come to be known as the year of apartheid. These reports have built on decades of the intellectual work and the political advocacy of Palestinian scholars and organizations, although notably, they diverge from those legacies in significant ways that are relevant to our convening here. The mainstream approach is concerned with governance. It is predicated on Israel's opposition to establish a Palestinian state and arrives at the present moment as an unintended consequence. It carefully and deliberately avoids the colonial and the racist dimension of Israeli apartheid. In fact, Yeshdin and Beit Selem, the two Israeli human rights organizations who have come to this conclusion, insist that this is apartheid without racism. The other approach is decolonial and has been mapped out by Palestinian, the Palestinian intellectual tradition. It grapples head on with Jewish Zionist settler sovereignty and insists that Israel's racist nature is rooted in ideology, not circumstance, and it reflects a settler colonial structure. In my talk, I will explore the relationship between Zionism, apartheid, and settler colonialism to consider the implications of their entwinements, as well as the veracity of insisting we live in the post-colonial. It will begin by exploring the juridical and empirical application of the 1973 apartheid convention to Israel with an emphasis on the most important element in settler colonialism and in indigenous studies, land. It grapples, excuse me, and it will conclude with some commentary on the limits and utility, though mostly the limits, of legal remedies to overcome the Palestinian sovereignty trap. So here we have kind of the images that we know, just to emphasize the ever-shrinking parcels of land that are available to Palestinians. What I want to emphasize here is that Palestinians have lived throughout this territories, though bifurcated and fragmented violently from one another through juridical and territorial regimes that render them as non-sovereigns of their own entity and non-citizens of any particular entity within this singular jurisdiction. Apartheid, as we discuss it, is both the outcome of Zionist settler colonization that facilitates Palestinian removal and settler implantation, as well as the modal legal regime to consolidate these territorial takings. So here we have one of the submissions by the Badil Refugee and Residency Rights Center based in Bethlehem with ECOSOC status, the United Nations, amongst this Palestinian tradition, intellectual and activist tradition, which in 2012 submitted to the Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, this very involved chart that went to the heart of Zionism and not merely a governance structure to insist that Israel has created a regime that distinguishes between Jewish Israeli nationals as distinct from Israeli citizens, as distinct from all Palestinian others. 
So this bifurcation between nationality and citizenship means that there's no such thing as an Israeli national. And this happens to be obscured, especially in the mythologies. But Palestinian citizens are part of the Knesset. They're more equal in Israel than they are in the rest of the Arab world. But it hinges on this conception of them being indigenous and subject to an eliminatory regime as well. The law of return of 1950 defines a Jewish national as someone born of a Jewish mother who has become converted to Judaism and is not a member of any other religion. The law of return extraterritorialized Jewish nationality and conferred exclusive rights to Jewish nationals, in particular Jewish nationals. And here is where the state transformed religious identity into a juridical national status which makes it distinct and also complicates the discussion on the relationship between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism to the unfamiliar. This right gives them, this, this, this transition gives them the right, exclusive right to obtain citizenship and to settle anywhere within Israel's jurisdiction, including in the West Bank settlements. The legal framework of Jewish nationality effectively affords Jewish persons anywhere in the world more rights than the Palestinians whose presence precedes Israel's establishment, including those who did not, who were not exiled and became citizens of the state. Now, the nationality law of 1952, better understood as the citizenship law because the law affords automatic citizenship to Jewish nationals while denying citizenship and residency rights to Palestinians who were driven out, repealed and denationalized Palestinians by repealing the Palestinian Citizenship Order of 1925. This rendered the entirety of the Palestinian people, a nation, as stateless. The law of return, together with the law of nationality, established a tiered order that distinguishes between Israel's population who are nationals and citizens from its Christian and Muslim and atheist Palestinian population who are citizens only. This distinction has facilitated the flow of privileges to residency, citizenship, land ownership, freedom of movement, and the right to leave and return to one's country exclusively to Jewish nationals across a singular geography throughout historic Palestine. Adala, the legal center for Arab minority rights in Israel, maintains an ongoing database of laws cur currently totaling 65 that discriminate on the basis, pa against Palestinians on the basis of national belonging. Israel's binary system enables the state to achieve its stated goal of maintaining a significant Jewish majority even in the face of natural population growth. In particular, the bifurcation facilitates a policy of forced population transfer. The most blatant pillar of that policy is Israel's denial of Palestinian refugees, totaling some six million, their right to return to their homes and land, which the state frames as an existential threat to the country. Other laws include the 2003 ban on family reunification, the admissions committee law in 2011, the 2010 Amendment to the Negative, Deve Negative Development Authority, and the Israel Land Administration Law of 2009. Da -da 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 -da, la 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 la. All of this is to tell you, at least to try to communicate to you, how this very colonial, racist, oppressive system is cooked within a liberal structure of legal authority and management that gives Israel the veneer of democracy, and in fact, it is a settler democracy that affords those rights to a particular class. Now, what about the land? In 1948, Israel established the legal regime that actually continues to function throughout Israel and the, the Palestinian, known as the Palestinian territories. So what does this legal regime look like? The first act of Israel's government upon its founding was the establishment and the adoption of the Defense Emergency Regulations or the emergency rule that was enacted by British colonial administration in order to quell protest and insurgency across its colonial geographies from Malay to Kenya to Palestine, Jamaica and beyond. Israel struck only those sections that restricted Jewish immigration and land purchases. It then applied the emergency regulations on the Palestinians who remained within Israel who weren't yet citizens in 1952. Founding Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion and military leader plainly explained, quote, the military regime within 
Israel upon its founding, came into existence to protect the right of Jewish settlement in all parts of the state. The absentees property law of 1950 targeted the lands of Palestinians who had fled across the border and become refugees, as well as those who were internally displaced within the new, newly established state. It established four categories of absentee individuals and rendered absentee property eligible for confiscation and possession by a custodian of state land. Cynically, absentee individuals included approximately 750,000 Palestinian refugees to whom Israel denied the right to re-entry to claim their lands. This land is empty, therefore it can belong to the state, but the Palestinians who want to claim this land are denied entry in order to have the opportunity to do so. And not only was this applied to the refugees who were forcibly exiled across those tenuous armistice lines, but it was also denied to Palestinians who remained internally displaced, just as those Palestinians, for example, from the northern villages of Akrit and Bir'am. These were known, these Palestinians were known as the present absentees. The law naturalized the removal of the native population and confiscated the, the land without compensation to its Palestinian owners. Similar to this is a tactic known as closed areas. The edict arbitrarily prevented Palestinians from cultivating their agricultural lands and then as a result of non-cultivation rendered them as wastelands that had to, in this very also colonial trope, be put to good use. Using this framework in 1953, the government of Israel passed the land acquisition law, retroactively legalizing these land expropriations. In 1960, Israel enacted legislation that prohibited Palestinians explicitly from owning, leasing, or working on 97% of state-held lands. Together, these regulations, together with a series of other land laws, worked to dispossess Palestinian refugees, as well as those who remained within the state of their homes, businesses, and approximately two million acres of cultivable land. This is about land, right? This isn't about democratizing the colony and becoming equal citizens in Israel. This is about territory and the connection to the land. So I want to emphasize that and how that's obscured both in these legal frameworks as well as in the recent apartheid reports. Israel ended its racialized martial regime against Palestinians in 1966, but soon after applied the absentee property law as well as martial law to the Palestinian lands in the West Bank and Gaza following the 1967 war. Now, here Israel faced a conundrum. The same laws that it was applying within its borders, or non-declared borders, I should say, from 1948 to 1966, it couldn't as easily apply to the West Bank in Gaza for the very explicit reason that by then, territorial acquisition by force was condemned in the UN Charter Article 2. It had just become passé. Conquest had become passé and therefore illegal. Israel faced that challenge. The other reason that Israel didn't want to just annex this land that it so coveted was that if it annexed the land, it would have to also absorb the Palestinian population, which would disrupt its demographic Jewish majority. So how then did Israel continue to advance its settler colonial ambitions of territorial acquisition facing these two challenges? Well, it used the law, and it used the liberal veneer of law. The argument that I advanced is that Israel created a legal and political machinery uh, in order to do this. So, so many of us, when we see ongoing settlements, 5,000 new units, new settlements, new land confiscations, are angry and have this reaction, how is Israel getting away with this? Oh, it couldn't get away with this, it's only because of power and its imperial patron of the United States. When well, I argue that Israel was able to acquire these lands not in spite of the law, but specifically because of the law. Occupation law gave Israel the legal right to be present in the West Bank and Gaza and to be the governing power. It's precisely under this veneer that Israel is able to advance several legal fictions. The first of them is the missing reversioner argument, which says that if there is no sovereign, there can be no occupation, thereby arguing that because Jordan was not, even though Jordan tried to be the sovereign of the West Bank, was only recognized by Pakistan and Britain in 1952, it was not the sovereign. Egypt was not the sovereign of the Sinai, but only a, a trustee, a governing authority as an interim. 
But this was all predicated on the fiction that Palestinians did not exist, right? So this is the first part of the argument. Then to advance the, argue, the, the, the fiction that all of Israel's settlements were in fact military encampments rather than civilian structures which are permanent. Another legal fiction that was advanced by Meir Shemgar, who was an architect of this legal regime, was to say that there is a distinction between indefinite and permanent. If it's indefinite, we don't know when it's going to end, but it can end. If it's permanent, it will not end. It was this temporal fiction of an indefinite nature of Israel's settlement regime that allows Israel to continue to expand its takings under the need of military necessity, the fiction of military encampments, together with the, with the temporal fiction. Add to that what Israel did with the UN Security Council Resolution 242. The final Security Council Resolution misses the definite predicate article preceding occupied territories. So rather than saying Israel must withdraw from the occupied territories, it's says Israel's must withdraw from the territories recently occupied in the recent war. Israel has used that missing definite article to argue that we'll withdraw, but you didn't say from which territories. So that if they withdrew from the Sinai, as they did in 1979, that that would satisfy the meaning of 242. And then the third part of this mechanism, of course, is the US intervention, which provides Israel with unequivocal military, diplomatic, and financial support. All of this together creates what is tantamount to a violation of Article 2D of the Apartheid Convention. And as you can see, these are the territorial takings under Oslo also facilitated the territorial takings of Area C, 60% of the West Bank. Here are the takings in East Jerusalem as Israel has expanded its municipal boundary. Here are the takings in Gaza, which we can talk about at length. I'm happy to answer your questions. Yes, Israel remains an occupying power of Gaza, but notice here, even in the war, that Israel's expansion of the buffer zones of Gaza under the veneer of, of warfare is further territorial taking. It's taking as much land as possible with as few indigenous people as possible and concentrating as many indigenous people as possible in the smallest amounts of land. We see that everywhere. Here you also see the Gaza border. This last one I want to show you, however, is the concentration of Palestinians within Israel. So that this settler colonial framework doesn't begin and end in the occupied territories, but actually extends from the center to the, to the um, periphery, so to speak, across the Mediterranean and the sea. How, uh, sorry, from the Mediterranean to the River Jordan. Okay. So let, let me move to another, something that we also take for granted, which is that what does apartheid have to do with this? And especially here as we focus, and I really appreciate the Sharjah Institute for the triangulation we were speaking between the African continent, the Asian continent, West Asia in particular, as well as North America. So while the international community has slowly and belatedly uh, moved to isolate the South African regime, Israel sustained, Isra Israel sustained the South African apartheid economy through the development of a robust arms industry. The South African government regarded Israel as a fellow country under siege, quote, situated in a predominantly hostile, hostile world inhabited by dark peoples. In 1973, the UN General Assembly condemned the unholy alliance between Portuguese colonialism, South African racism, Zionism, and Israeli imperialism. Two years later, the UN would condemn Zionism as a form of racism and racial discrimination in Resolution 3379, placing it squarely within the agenda of the decade against racism originally conceived to dismantle African apartheid. The international community achieved that mandate within the span of two decades on the African continent. At that very moment of South African and Namibian liberation, Zionist settler colonization and apartheid found a new lifeline in the Oslo peace process, which ultimately continued to facilitate Israel's settler colonial expansion, now with a cooperative uh, Palestinian leadership as a subcontracting authority. The only other point that I want to make about apartheid here is to emphasize that South African apartheid has historically revised to refer to a system of internal domestic discrimination, of white supremacy, 
right? One that also fits within the American imaginary of white supremacy in the United States that's completely separate from, Israel, from the US's own colonial structure and its own continued takings, including the, the Nape peoples. And so it's important to remember that South African apartheid was also settler colonial in nature. It also sought to expand the Afrikaner territor territory while concentrating um, black Africans onto smaller and smaller tracts of land. Okay, so what does all of this legalese do for us? One of, and here I'll conclude with this section. Okay, so to conclude, many people have fetishized the law in a way that seeks to do with the law what we fail to do with mass mobilization in politics so far. That if we just appear between a fair arbiter, then the judge will surely side based on facts and logic outside of political pressures. That is a fanciful fiction. There is no such thing as the separation of law and politics and law and power. And certainly the ICC is an exemplar of this relationship between law and power. Since its establishment in 2002, the International Criminal Court has almost exclusively prosecuted African heads of state, causing several African nations to withdraw from the court. Structurally, it has created rules and laws that actually protect Western uh, sovereign nations using uh, uh, articles, for example, like Article 17 on complementarity, which allows a state the ability to prosecute itself and have the right of first jurisdiction before an international tribunal can do it for itself. All of this is setting up the structure that has immunized the global north from international accountability and rendered, rendered excuse me, the rest of the world's population subject to its scrutinizing and sanctioning arm. So now, finally, Palestinians are appearing before the ICC, and there seems to be an undue amount of hope on that prospect. How will I dim this hope for you while not throwing out the baby with the bathwater? <laughs> yeah, I want to end on a positive note as well. So there are several warning signs. First of all, what we know already is that the prosecutors took something like 10 years just to decide on jurisdiction and to decide that the ICC had jurisdiction even after Palestine was recognized as a state in the General Assembly in 2012. That should have been quite simple, and yet it wasn't. That took over a decade, okay? So that's, let's just think about how problematic it is. Secondly, based on the, based on the submissions by Palestinian organizations and advocates to the ICC, what is the prosecutor, which remains the power, which maintains the power of discretion, focused on? The prosecutor has referred five categories of war crimes committed by Israeli forces, four in Gaza, plus the transfer of settlers into occupied territories, and six categories of war crimes committed by Palestinian armed groups. There is no reference to apartheid or any other crimes against humanity. Now let's say that we do proceed, we do successfully uh, have the prosecutor, now a new prosecutor, I think Kamal Khan, who has taken the position to actually pursue apartheid. Well, for Israeli officials to be indicted for apartheid, the prosecution needs to show an intent to maintain systematic racial oppression. But even Israel's human rights organizations say there's no racism. Okay. This will be very difficult to show on, any, uh, on the part of any single individual because also know the ICC doesn't prosecute states. The ICC only prosecutes individual criminal liability. And in fact, there has never been a prosecution of the crime of apartheid in any court. In this sense, we see the charge of Israeli apartheid as being not only an indictment of and a challenge to, interna to, to Israel, but also to all of international criminal law. If the ICC cannot bring itself to investigate and prosecute apartheid crimes in the most widely documented instance of apartheid since the regimes of Southern Africa, after it has been presented with documentation and asked to do so by those subjected to the apartheid regime, that will say a lot about the politics of international criminal law. It will also undergird what we already know, which is that the law will not save Palestinians. That remains the onus of Palestinians. More, as the limits 
impossibilities and fetishization of statehood as a pathway to liberation continues to wane, there is increasing emphasis on and the return to decolonial pathways, which it seems that our convening in Sharjah is also a part of. Thank you so much. Apologies for going over. Uh, thank you very, very much, um, and wonderful to be part of this panel. Um, I hope I can add some uh, texture to what was already a very powerful presentation. Um, I want to begin uh, by introducing the artwork of Umisa Fischler, an artist that I know from Cape Town and whose work I've selected for a forthcoming book um, from which I draw th three themes for this uh, presentation. I want to talk about apartheid's double binds, I want to talk about the problem of grand and petty apartheid. And finally, I want to talk about what I call the double futures of post-apartheid freedom. Undoing apartheid. The conundrum of apartheid only really became noticeable in its wake, that is, in its afterlife. Since the term apartheid has now gained widespread currency in a current global conjuncture, it may help to outline what is found wanting in the critique of apartheid in the context of South Africa where its political mythology and rationality first presented itself. To highlight the problem uh, of apartheid's problematization, I turn to Willie Bester's harrowing sculpture, Trojan Horse Three. This work of art is a grim reminder of a failure on the part of anti-apartheid critics to heed cautions issuing from feminist reckonings with structures of oppression in the aftermath of the Second World War. In fact, it recalls a very precise caution issued by Monique Wittig, which is worth recounting for a discussion of the afterlives of apartheid. In a groundbreaking essay from 1984, Wittig notes, I quote, the horse built by the Greeks is doubtless also one for the Trojans, while they still consider it uh, with uneasiness. It is barbaric for its size, but also for its form, too raw for them, the effeminate ones, as Virgil calls them. But later on, they become fond of the apparent simplicity within which they see sophistication. They see by now all the elaboration that was hidden at first under brutal coarseness. They come to see as strong, powerful the work they had considered formless. They want to make it theirs, to adopt it as a monument and shelter it in their walls, a gratuitous object whose only purpose is to be found in itself. But what if it were a war machine, end quote? What indeed if it were a war machine? Beyond the work that the sculpture performs as a memorial to a massacre that gained international notoriety as the Trojan Horse Massacre on the edges of Cape Town in 1985, Wittig helps us to direct our attention to a particularly haunting aspect of Bester's creation. In fact, she directs our attention to the double binds of apartheid in Bester's work, where an initial hesitancy about a grotesque form of form quickly turns into an enigmatic object to be monumentalized and with which we, become, with which we make a premature peace. Similarly, Bester brushes up against the limit of the monumentalization of the grotesque and macabre. He asks, in turn, that we see in the work of art what may yet to be unanticipated in the critique of apartheid. The premise for understanding apartheid's double bind is simple. The implications for undoing apartheid, less so. Apartheid, after all, was experienced not once, but twice, as grand apartheid and petty apartheid. If grand apartheid describes the architectonics of power replete with metaphors drawn from architecture and engineering, petty apartheid, despite its diminutive name and presumed banality, proved much more enduring as a form of the apartheid of the everyday. Bester's sculpture asks that we not rush to ground on the intensity of violence that the ma massacre references, and instead turn to the burden of the name assigned to the event. It is, as Wittig suggests, in the shock of words by the association, disposition, and arrangement that now calls for a work of turning raw material into something else, perhaps another perspective on freedom. Perhaps, as Wittig suggests, the war machine requires a detour to rework the meaning of freedom adequate to the desire for, post, for the post-apartheid? Is there a plan for gathering the aesthetic resources of myth and tragedy, where myth harbors the resources of violence, 
tragedy the resources for self-definition self in modernity to exceed the scripts of apartheid. Two orientations of co common sense understandings of apartheid are necessary if we are to fulfill both the task of undoing and the task of transcendence. Firstly, rather than the familiar translation of apartheid as legalized segregation, the word apartheid is perhaps better comprehended as the rule of parts, a form of elementary thought that had its early genesis in the experimental psychology laboratories in Leipzig, Germany in the 1920s as a response to what Donna Jones has recently called the birth of, birth of life philosophy. Secondly, the idea of race specific to apartheid may not be as self-evident as we initially assume. In both respects, apartheid, I will argue, modernized the idea of race, not merely by extending legal precedent of Roman Dutch law, but through carefully plotted psychic breaches in everyday life. Surely, with this distinction in mind, a remapping of the idea of race that was internal to the political rationality of apartheid is desperately called for. Such remapping will no doubt lead to a different approach to undoing this virulent strain of race that took hold in the project of petty apartheid and which now appears to be blocking the desire for post-apartheid freedom. Unfortunately, the more we presume to recognize this apartheid of the everyday, the less we appear to understand it. In the 1960s, Marxist critics in South Africa came close to identifying the sources of this banal form of apartheid in their references to apartheid as a colonialism of a special type or internal colonialism. But while searching for the sources of race in a capacious archive of 19th century settler colonialism, they failed to discover its sources in a settler public sphere which, with which modern science unfortunately made common cause. I'm suggesting that petty apartheid drew on a form of race which was molded in the lacuna of the end of, of the abolition of slavery and the expansion of industrial technologies around the 1830s, when the dance of myth and reason resulted in a series of missteps. Experienced as interminable, petty apartheid was the culmination of the transfer of race from one technical system, slavery, to another, industrialization over a period of 200 years. In the name of petty apartheid, race was associated with life that would be deemed as merely mechanical. Recalled through the image of the slave, a modern idea of race drove the onset of immaterial forms of labor, disciplinary modes of power, and later after the Second World War, a redefinition of politics of population as trapped in a circular causality. Briefly, petty apartheid contains a dangerously simplistic response to a shift in the Promethean distributions of energy between humans and machines that accompanied a revolution in thermodynamics in the 19th century. The first law of thermodynamics laid the foundations for a principle of energy conservation to, speci to specify the place of the human in a nature and technology nexus. By the, by the 1860s, a second law of thermodynamics was made possible by a scientific metaphor of Maxwell's demon that enabled control over an entropic form of energy. This second law, while f failing to live up to the expectation of perpetual machi uh, motion machines, nevertheless affected contentions about the distribution of energy across the spectrum of human nature and technology. As the source of a metabolic rift in Marx and Engels, as transforming labor into a perfect machine, Sergei Podlinsky, or as a sensory energetic loop resulting in active sensing, Wilhelm Wundt. Petty apartheid seems to have settled on the dynamic of sense perception enabled by Wundt, who studies into nerve mechanics in the, in the bonds of individual and group psychologies found expression in a working out of a 20th century category of race with which apartheid and South Africa became synonymous. Its most explicit assemblage can be traced back to the period of the First World War. In light of the catastrophe of the senses produced by war, a discourse of aperception measuring the alignments and misalignments between the intensity of sensation and the clarity of perception emerged as the object of a new field of study called experimental psychology. Developed in the laboratories of Wilhelm Wundt in Leipzig, Germany, experimental psychology would be an early inspiration for an ideologue of apartheid who found in it the resources for breaching the psychic structure and marshalling its latent energies 
towards predetermined ends of population control. Beyond twisting a university discourse into a sin sinister plot, petty apartheid melded into a belated and deformed capitalist formation sustained by a circular causality of race, and in this manner, it created the conditions for perpetual war that would survive the crumbling edifice of apartheid. So how are we to approach this Trojan horse, which we initially viewed with suspicion, but now embrace as a monument? What I have to propose relates to a doubling of a project of enchanting the idea of freedom by means of an aesthetic education. Drawing liberally from Gayatri Spivak, I'd like to suggest that only an aesthetic education, perhaps, can, bring, can begin to retrain the links between sense and perception necessary for undoing the discrete level of petty apartheid. This will require a reimagined temporalization of our concept of the post-apartheid, to craft an interval between the exigencies of liberation and the duration of education aimed at relinking what apartheid took apart through a project of nerve mechanics. Overcoming apartheid will require relinking the relations between sense and perception that apartheid wrenched apart. The interval is both a strategy for avoiding the collisions orchestrated in the coevolution of the human and technology, and a way of re retrieving a techne from its subsumption in technology. This is not an original idea in the slightest, but one enacted in the scene of the petty apartheid through the idiom of jazz that reconnected the Indian Ocean and Atlantic Ocean experiences of slavery. It is a thought inspired by the work of Abdullah Ibrahim, who once narrated a story about the slip of the tongue in the everyday of Cape Town. Ibrahim noted that when people spoke of going to the bioscope, the cinema, it was not unusual to hear them say that they were off to see a double future, not a double feature. If slips of the tongue are reminders of the ominous sign of history calling twice, first, as, first time as tragedy and second time as farce, Ibrahim counters the collisions orchestrated by apartheid with an image of jazz improvisation. Consider Ibrahim's meditation on image, music, and metaphor in the critique of apartheid conveyed in Chris Austin's 1987 film, A Brother with a Perfect Timing. Ibrahim reflects on Mannenberg, both the name of a place in Athlone and a symbol of apartheid's forced removals, and jazz composition, which replays a repertoire of repressed aspects of the critique of apartheid with which I began. Speaking from exile in New York in 1987, he tells us, Duke had perfect timing. Timing is arriving at the right point at the right time with the minimum effort. In Mannenberg, Basil Kutzia, the tennis saxophone player, told us a story Imagine a Saturday morning in the township. I mean, you've never seen so many children anywhere in your life than a Saturday morning in the township. Children, people going shopping, cats, dogs, chickens. So here these two guys ambling down the road have a little whiff, a taste. Now these brothers have perfect timing. The moment of perfect timing crystallizes in everyone focusing on this moment. In the film clip that accompanies Ibrahim's meditation on the scene, we are drawn to a cutaway of two brothers walking down a dusty Cape Flat street, sharing in the pleasures of what appears to be a joint in a joint that is out of time, for all intents and purposes, in time together. As they amble along, a little girl enters the frame, skipping, passing them from behind and moving directly into the path of an oncoming car. Ibrahim explains that without losing a beat, one brother just scoops the girl up, puts her down on his side, on the right side, takes the joint from the other hand and back in front, and there we go. Perfect timing, man. Master musicians. Set aside any thoughts about the temptation of the joint and think about the strategy permitted in this anecdote for coming into stride beyond the collisions of sense and perception plotted in the everyday life of petty apartheid. What we hear Ibrahim describe here is a model of education that jazz offers the university and its publics. We are called to the promise of adaptation and improvisation, where arriving is premised on not colliding. Coming out of apartheid, 
The illusion of sound and image enveloping Ibrahim's meditation is a doubling of a call for an education capable of enchanting both freedom and everyday life. A form of aesthetic education in which sense and perception are relinked to avoid a slide into mechanized life signified by the orders of race. For the university, this will entail both a process of unlearning and a process of learning to learn from another's point of view, preferably from below. If this twofold responsibility of the in this twofold responsibility of the university, I suggest that it begin by creating a space unfettered by the sophistry of mastery or the Socratic methods of recall, where education amounts to merely remembering everything that is previously known but forgotten. Rather, I'm suggesting a space between the university and its publics, unencumbered by the formalization of education where it is presumed that we know nothing, and where stumbling on the psychopathologies of everyday life affords us an opportunity for relinking sense and perception. This is the site where we might begin to replace public parts with public arts, in a manner that re-enchants education and everyday life with a futurity beyond the determinations of a condition of race that lingers as a threat of perpetual war. With all the trappings of a repressed mythic inheritance that bound human subjection to machines, petty apartheid was configured as a Trojan horse dispatched to conjure feeling of unceasing civil war, only to tautologically require a stoking of the flames of civil war by means of everyday uh, provocations to justify the enforcement of a condition of stasis, a future collapsed into a recurring present. The prohibitive and constraining circular causality took on the characteristics of a self-perpetuating circuit in which race served as a standing reserve of energy that could be relied on to propel and regulate the exercise of power. The result was a convenient state fiction about sensory aphasia, a belief premised on the false problem of the assumed dissonance of images and words against which the orders of race were mapped and enforced. Where we apprehend race in this tautology specific to apartheid now determines whether its political sophistry will ever be effectively outwitted. A model of political education that seeks mastery over this wretched condition, or one which pro proceeds by methods derived from anthropology and history to recollect what, that which is forgotten will no longer entirely suffice for the task of undoing apartheid. Perhaps only an aesthetic education attuned to retraining the retraining of the senses can prepare us for such a future beyond apartheid. In this way, the sources of a banal yet volatile marker of the iterability of race under apartheid may be discerned and potentially surpassed. The question then, as now, is how are we to conceivably re-enchant freedom in a manner that guides us out of those obscure conditions of race which can only faintly be discerned as impressions and traces left in machines of memory. Perhaps we will need to set to work precisely where race marks the conflicting interpolations of petty apartheid, and when aesthetic education may set about relinking sense and perception from the shards left in the wake of apartheid. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, uh, my uh, presentation will be uh, connected directly to the exhibition that is on view uh, at the uh, uh, Sharjah Art Foundation Spaces Gallery 1, 2, and 3, uh, titled uh, What Is Not, uh, curated by Hur Qasmi. Uh, so I will uh, probably be uh, quite uh, short because um, I'm already allocated um, three uh, spaces. And uh, um, yeah, so I uh, recommend that you go and uh, see if you haven't seen the exhibition. A statement concerning the uh, institutional history of the museum. The Palestinian Museum of Natural History and Humankind is cubist in its impossibility. <laughs> 
it is occupied, exiled at home and everywhere abroad. An entirely new place. It rests nowhere while waiting for our return. Four centuries behind the times, as unpatriotic as it is inefficient. It is the stupid obstinacy of the refugee and the subject of a natural contempt. The museum is greedy, existing in such abject poverty that opinion is an impossible luxury. The Palestinian Museum of Natural History and Humankind is the observance of accursed ignorance, insists on the infinity of traces, and persists irrespective of fragmentation. It is a local rehabilitation of the future. The Palestinian Museum of Natural History and Humankind is the international, an institution in the service of universal history. It is only this impossibility. Newsletter Summer 2011, pages 16 and 17. Earth and the solar system. The end of neo-nationalism. On the comparative certainty of extraterrestrial life and its significance for humankind. Nearly 4.6 billion years ago, within a vast cloud of interstellar space, a small pocket of gas and dust collapsed under its own gravity, and our solar system was born. As part of this system, our Earth is always in flux and is constantly remodeled by powerful forces. These forces can often appear as sudden and unexpected phenomena. Our popular Earth and solar system gallery displays rocks, sediments, and volcanic rocks that are relevant to representing the origins of history of the Earth and the solar system. It enables the visitors to explore the dynamic forces that formed and are continually reforming the Earth and the solar system. Our most recent exhibition at the Palestinian Museum of Natural History and Humankind examines what's one such dynamic force. This, the sem, uh, sedimentation of chauvinist attitudes resulting from the misrecognition of similar creatures as otherwise. This fetish of difference, wherein the slightest superficial irresemblance is made to obscure the overwhelming truth of humankind natural solidarity, appears as a force of nature. The less, uh, the less verifiable difference there is, the more aggressively the remainder is mobilized against the conscious recognition of a scientific fact that the Earth is home to a single human community. Palestine 
as the name of a place that is unavailable where it exists, a pastime that is also the future, is also the name of an absent self-consciousness of humankind, its natural history. As detailed knowledge of the cosmos increases day by day, it has became, become a relative certainty that other life exists outside of our solar system. This realization, as it disseminates, ought perhaps to have a clarifying effect. Our exhibit, the lowest point on Earth, Memorial Park, anticipates this revelation asking after its real material effects. Someday, when the blazing sun fills the streets with the color of blood, the earth will be brand new. Never before seen, not like this. The stones piled up where we lived will have a meaning. And they will have been put there for no other reason but to explain it. This earth on which we have lived and with whose good people we have spent years of defeat will be something new. It is just a beginning. Humankind doesn't know why. Humankind imagined that the main street on the way back home was only the beginning of a long, long road. Everything on this earth throbs with a sadness which is not confined to weeping. It is a challenge. No, my friend, we won't leave. And we have no regrets. No, and nor will we finish what we began together in childhood. This obscure feeling that you had as you left, this small feeling must grow into a giant one, deep within you. It must expand. You must seek it in order to find yourself. Here, among the ugly debris of defeat, we won't come to you, but you must return to us. Come back to learn what life is and what existence is worth. We are all waiting for you. Thank you. Thank you, the three of you, so much for these thought-provoking um, pieces. Uh, Nura, I, I'll start with you. You, we say the word apartheid, right? And of course, uh, amongst Palestinians and those who have been um, fighting, we've used that word, but this was a, ta a word that was taboo, not until very, maybe two years ago, I think. Uh, yeah, less even, that we've been using this word apartheid in relationship to Palestine. And so let's talk about this. Who has the permission to say apartheid? And also, um, how do we uh, make sense of the distance between this ability to speak and the situation on the ground in Palestine? Yeah. So I just, you know, just for the audience to, to have an example in mind, uh, when you take a one, one city or one town in Palestine, for instance, Bethlehem, uh, which is quite symbolic 
of uh, other cities in Palestine. Bethlehem, Jerusalem, for instance, is seven miles apart from each other. But does Bethlehem actually exist? Most of Bethlehem is behind the wall or settlements have taken Bethlehem. Bethlehemites can only, uh, has only the control of 1%. There is hardly anything there. Palestine has shrunk, as Khalil has mentioned, 48, 67, every single year thereafter. So there's quite a difference between how we've advanced in our permission to speak and what has been happening on the land. Can you speak? You should be careful before you ask me to speak. I might give another lecture. <laughs> I've already taken too long, but this is actually very thought-provoking. What, what, Natalie, you're absolutely right. So much of this has been seen as almost um, quite revolutionary, especially in the American context, where it's so taboo to even talk about Israel, and where it's only become of late a bite, you know, a wedge between Republicans and Democrats on the question of Israel, right? And the the publication, specifically by the Human Rights Watch report on apartheid, even gave permission in the midst of the Hebbe or Intifada last May for five. Congress persons to stand on the House floor in the US Capitol to say apartheid is not a democracy, which was a specific indictment of Israel. So a couple of things on this. Number one, in the original invocation of apartheid as it relates to Israel, Palestinian intellectuals had insisted that Israel was not like apartheid, but that Zionism and apartheid were political and intellectual analogs. So the same way that apartheid has a charge and it conjures for you oppression, racism, uh, subjugation, something unjust, Zionism did the same work during the heyday of the Third World Revolt, which now obviously is being weaponized um, and used in, in ways that, and romanticized unnecessarily as Professor Spivak um, intimated to and showed us. And so what happened to all of that work? So much of it was the subsuming of Zionism and its rehabilitation within the Oslo peace process, right? So what we're experiencing right now is a radical analytical return rather than the creation of something new and one that we can only acknowledge by acknowledging this Palestinian labor. So that's on the one. On the second, it does give a permission to speak. Why? In my estimation, part of this permission to speak is not because Palestinians are not necessarily allowed to speak, as we've seen even now in this um, war and onslaught on the Ukrainian people. And we are in you know, steadfast solidarity with the Ukrainian people and their self-determination. We also can't turn a blind eye to the fact of how infuriating it is that Western diplomats actually have the vocabulary for conquest, for occupation, for disproportionate force, for targeting of civilians, for sanctions, right? And yet all of this vocabulary becomes marshaled in support of, of Ukrainians in a way that it's actually attacked in relation to Kashmir or Palestine, right, or even the Rohingya, and thinking about other subjugated populations, there is a racism at play. There is a Western supremacy at play, one that has made the European Holocaust our canonical example of tragedy, and Jewish people as the canonical victims of Western civilization that obscures the genocidal campaigns against people of color across colonial geographies as highlighted with an indictment by Aimi Cesare, who describes this as the boomerang effect. That Hitler was the work of Europe's colonial conquest that had had to constitute state formation and development in and of itself. How does that history get lost? Right? And so in a similar way for us to speak on apartheid, almost we have to have permission, right? To denigrate or to transgress Western civilization's canonical examples. 
And regarding the permission to speak, I mean, Edward Said wrote about this very clearly in 1982 in his essay, Permission to Narrate, in the aftermath of the 1982 Israeli invasion of Lebanon, where the Palestinians and Arabs writ large, Lebanese obviously, could not appear as victims. This is, this is the, the crux of our dehumanization. We're shot and killed and then blamed for it. We cannot appear as victims, and our aggressors cannot appear as aggressors. Hence, this permission to narrate what happens when we speak for ourselves and embody that story. And so between 1982 and 2021, I would say, as you alluded, Natalie, we've made a tremendous, tremendous strides. We can say settler colonialism on television. Right? We can say Israel's an apartheid state on television. We can say that Palestinians are victims on television. Right? And yet, on the ground in Palestine, none of that necessarily is manifesting. But here is not, right, here is not a moment of despair, but here is a moment of the relationship between our public imagination and the politics of hope and what's possible. Right? Public opinion obviously is not sufficient, but it is a predicate element that enables us to continue to build um, movement and, and martial support. There is no panacea, right? There is no silver bullet. And so I would say that these strides that we've made in the permission to narrate are absolutely necessary. Um, and upon them, we build the structures that continue uh, towards liberation. Thank you, Nora. Thank you. Um, uh, permit, did you want to comment? Because I saw you already, <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I'd like to, to uh, yeah, I'd like to get to the, your art and you speak about how do we undo apartheid and you particularly go to the masterful Trojan Horse by Willie Baxter. Uh, you return for it for insight, for clarity, for a more balanced motion forward. Um, you know, I think about all these movements from political to artistic, they're all important for us to contribute to get to the change that we need. But it seems like art offers us this um, complex uh, understanding and uh, this complex gaze into the reality. So the Trojan horse, I'd like to ask you about uh, go to the Trojan horse and what it's made of. It's made of these violent materials, including bombshells and machine gun. How does that uh, speak to uh, undoing apartheid? Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, there's a, there's a very long answer to this question because it's a question that's preoccupied me since 1985 at the time of the massacre when I was a student activist in the, in the area in Athlone. And I, just to, to frame it a little bit, you know, I mean, one of the debates that uh, this Trojan Horse uh, Massacre intervened in was a debate across the generations about liberation and education and the priorities and exigencies of each. And there was something about the struggle of apartheid that was always also an affirming concept, a, a concept of building something else, a desire for something different. And the Trojan Horse Massacre put in place a condition of stasis that put an end to that debate. So part of it is to return to the question of you know, the temporalities that define our concepts of change and revolution. I think that what Beste is, is doing in his work, and not only in this Trojan horse uh, sculpture, but in a lot of his other work, is to think about what it means to assemble and disassemble simultaneously. And the problem is that in many of the ways in which we failed in our critique of apartheid, and we have failed, we failed in many respects to unravel this infrastructure that had been put in place, and hence my long meandering kind of attempt to say that there's a much more complex formation here that is linked to discipline reforms and the university that we would have to attend to in a very, very careful and systematic way. So the question really is, you know, how does one begin to reassemble desire in the moment, you know, where catastrophe looms? I mean, the contemporary South Africa, and I'm, I'm, I know this is being recorded, but, you know, is a, is a dismal failure. The post-apartheid is a dismal failure. And we need to account for that failure as people who struggled against this condition, who tried to constitute the new. 
My argument then about aesthetic education, and you know, I speak from within a position of a uh, from a position where I'm based at a historically black university that was never allowed an arts education. So historically black universities in South Africa were never allowed access to the creative disciplines. And through the Humanities Center at University of the Western Cape, try to constitute a space that would enable youth mobilities across the divides of apartheid, rural, urban, peri-urban, urban, and to begin thinking about what it might do to awaken the senses, but to unravel this fissure running through sense and perception that apartheid constituted in the everyday. And I must say, I think that you know, the idiom of jazz, as much as Bester and others were, you know, helps us to think this, the idiom of jazz has been a profound alibi to think the probabilities and possibilities of reinventing a post-apartheid imaginary. Thank you for that. Um, so, Khalil, uh, you started with a performance um, that's in converse, a reading uh, performance in conversation with the exhibition at the Sharjah Art Foundation. Um, and with your ongoing project, which is the Palestine Museum of Natural History and Humankind. You reflect on institutions and how they contextualize culture or artifacts or objects and create space for us to rethink these narratives. So the notion of the colonial structure in your museum challenges Western structures. Speak about that, and I'm thinking especially of the Gaza Zoo Sculpture Garden and the lowest point on Earth memorial, for example. Well, uh, the, uh, the, the project uh, of the Palestinian Museum of Natural History and Humankind uh, uh, started by presenting uh, and uh, basically questioning the notions of the uh, museum building in the Western uh, uh, traditions, the, uh, which uh, uh, in Palestine, uh, when uh, the idea of thinking uh, to have a museum, uh, all the models of available to think of uh, a museum was mainly uh, how to become like uh, uh, an international kind of uh, museum local and also important to be an international. Uh, now uh, the, the museum, or at least the project, tried to invest, tried to explore the notions of uh, the components and the structures of natural history museums, which they are mainly uh, were established uh, to com Firm to a sort of uh, solidify the existence of uh, the nation building in, uh, in the Occident, mainly. And uh, it was um, mainly composed of uh, departments, like a botanical department, earth, uh, and, uh, earth and the solar system, geology and paleontology departments. And uh, they became the sort of structures where we should un uh, understand and go about understanding natural history and how it's connected with the nation building through this uh, approach and through this structure of thinking. And uh, the, 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 the project tried to sort of mimic that and see if there is a possibility or there's anything in this sort of colonial, as uh, uh, was discussed earlier, if there's a possibility that something about colonialism perhaps can be of a benefit in a sense. And you know, can we think through this structure, uh, uh, through uh, the articulation of such departments in the nation building, in the uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, the uh, construct of um, a museum building part of the cultural discourse and the part of the uh, cultural uh, uh, engagements there. And the, 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 the aspect of scientific uh, notions were quite important in 
this, this uh, approach. And uh, so uh, an art project, for instance, the, this project as an art project, they had dealt with a scientific uh, sort of, uh, dealt with the sciences, the uh, botanical, uh, geology, paleontology, earth and the solar system. And that was, in a sense, quite beneficial, you know, to sort of uh, perhaps articulate works that are, in, in the case of the, uh, this project, uh, how can the life of an olive tree or representations of the li a life of an olive tree, uh, how people uh, 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 live with the olive tree, with the olives, with the branches, with the uh, trunks, with the wood, with the harvest, with the seasons, how perhaps this can be a narration, a scientific narration of a natural history museum and a representation of a natural history museum through uh, uh, the, uh, the scientific uh, departments were, that were established by the, uh, uh, or at least claimed to be established by the uh, colonial uh, nations at that time. And uh, at one point, uh, uh, it's sort of like it was a kind of a dead end because an art project uh, was uh, always wanted to challenge uh, scientific uh, constructs or uh, scientific uh, understands the uh, facts. Uh, the the project opted to negate the structure of departments and work with. Uh, sites that exist in Palestine and uh, in some ways uh, real and in other, way, in other ways uh, made up. Like for instance, you mentioned Gaza Zoo's culture garden. Um, this particular project was uh, started w with uh, uh, the news uh, that uh, you know, you know, in one of the uh, occurrences uh, yearly or uh, uh, every two years, when Gaza is completely bombarded by the uh, Israeli occupation, uh, the Israelis, uh, the occupation did not allow any humanitarian uh, uh, assistance to, uh, for Gaza. Uh, in, uh, of course, I mean, uh, the, uh, the total, I mean, uh, areas of Gaza was uh, destroyed, and and the, one of the areas apparently uh, was a zoo that was formed in Gaza. And uh, at one point, the animal rights, this you know, was almost uh, pleading for Israel that you know, I mean, a lot of the animals were dying there, and uh, perhaps uh, we can. Uh, go and save whatever is left. Uh, the zoo contained uh, one of the uh, animals that were in the zoo, two lions that were smuggled through a tunnel from Gaza, from uh, Egypt to Gaza, and were uh, part of the zoo. One of them apparently uh, did not survive from the bombard bombardment, and uh, so the, uh, the animal rights, uh, People wanted uh, to go and uh, save this lion, and uh, so it was like a, a kind of a very strange situation for the occupation to allow, uh, uh, in not to allow a humanitarian uh, assistance, but they uh, managed to advertise their uh, good acts, acts to go and save a lion. Uh, for some reason, they managed to allow the uh, animal rights to go and uh, take the lion. And uh, 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 from what we understood from the news, that you know they were just you know the Israelis were doing some great things, saving this lion and exiling it to Jordan, which it disappeared. So that that became you know the idea of the tunnels, the destruction, and this whole composition and uh, that it is an actual site that could 
narrate or can represent geological and paleontological aspect of a museum and this is the actual thing on the ground in Palestine and perhaps a geology department or a uh, paleontology department is about such artifacts or such activities. Yes, um, listening to you speak, I'm always, when we come to Palestine, you're always uh, flirting between, you know, um, truth and fiction and is the surreal. Uh, you speak about this lion, I think about, you know, borders and uh, not a farmer not able to cross with his donkey because the donkey doesn't have permission or that the donkey is able to cross because the donkey has permission but not the farmer and it goes on and on. Uh, I want to open it to the floor but before that I want to ask um, uh, the panelists if they would like to uh, make any remarks. Um, sure, absolutely. I, mean, I do think we need a shared conversation about apartheid and it, the uses of this term. I think we need to delimit the, the concept apartheid. of apartheid. And I, I, I do want to say that in some sense, you know, I think there is a way in which apartheid answers a lot of the, the questions that you raised and, you know, the descriptions that you've given. I mean, it's very familiar. But I think there is a dislodging of a particular subjectivity at the heart of apartheid that is often forgotten, and that's the figure of the slave. So in an earlier work, I did try and think about, you know, the roots of apartheid in colonialism in the 19th century, particularly around the killing of a Kosa king, Hinsa, in 1835, and the return of a skull, and so on and so forth. And the building of the Bantustans and the legislations that went around the homelands and so on, all of which, I think, they are commensurate kind of narratives to, to work with. And similarly with the museum that the museum has been a functional and a kind of critical space for thinking about the territorialities of apartheid. I'm wondering whether we share in the problem of apartheid a question of energy. And you know, when I think about, you know, when I was talking about the revolutions in thermodynamics, you referred to the scientific kind of uh, foundations of, of race and, 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 and apartheid. I think there might be something about a renewed concept of energetics that we might have to attend to. I mean, I think Gayatri was speaking about the planetary earlier. I think that we're failing dismally in thinking about through the humanities and the aesthetics, you know, what our concept of, of energy looks like. Energy. And I think that what I'm talking about here, in the, my interest in the aesthetic, is that the aesthetic might la lead us towards the kind of movement of objects. In other words, to get us out of the kind of stranglehold of stasis as the end points. And I think that's what the truth and reconciliation gave us. It gave us the promise of stasis, which was more of the same. And I think that there might be a need to kind of put in place in the critique of apartheid something that will think about, you know, how to surpass its, its rationality and its mythologies. So I, I, I very much welcome that um, provocation and I completely agree with you that the, uh, the history, the figure of the slave is completely obscured in the use of apartheid and particularly its codification. I think it's legal codification in 1973 as a crime against humanity and later in 1995 when the Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination then insisted that it didn't apply to a particular geography or history but was something that we can, you know, an international legal concept that we can so apply everywhere. So absolutely, I agree with you about what this obscures. In terms of energy, however, and rehabilitating that particular history, that's where I think the work of transnational solidarity uh, is really helpful, and also where that energy is useful for us, for us to think about. So I'm thinking particularly about black Palestinian solidarity, which is also a return, and even in that discussion, so much of the discussion has been about how the two examples are similar, how the condition of American blacks and Palestinians are similar. And yet that, that I think is historically and analytically not helpful, right? Because not, not the least of which is a history of chattel slavery over 400 years versus a, a history of some 100 plus years of uh, you know, Zionist settler colonization. Completely different histories and it obscures the history of um, enslavement in, in the Arab world as well. 
and, and, and almost absolves us of the responsibility to have those discussions. So then how does what happens energetically for us? I think one offering is to think about these solidarities as being provocations rather than static places we arrive to. They are not identity politics. They are invitations to participate in a leftist politics that is at the heart of it anti-imperialist, that has the ability to reveal right, racism in Palestine, and not just Israeli Zionist racism, but even anti-blackness within Palestinian communities, and has the ability to reveal the colonial nature of the United States and not just of US as empire, but also even amongst average Americans of their positionality as, as beneficiaries of empire, right? And so it's an invitation um, and not necessarily, but I agree that the words themselves. <laughs> the details, yes. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so I'm gonna open it up to the audience for questions. Questions for our panelists? I think there is there some. Do we have a microphone for you? Yeah. Okay. Yes? A question right there. Okay, and then in the middle. Hi, everyone. Yes, it was a nice session. I just have a general question which I would like to raise to all the panelists here. It, uh, it actually builds up from the idea of uh, Pramesh Lalu where he says that uh, you, know, uh, you, you, you try to shift your perspective of education from more of uh, like recollecting facts to actually starting to question reality and you know, trying to build insights from that. Okay, now from that, uh, from that point of view, I, uh, my general question was this. So uh, now we uh, now of course to this session we get, we get a general perspective where we get a general idea of, as to how the uh, global south think or how the uh, people I would say like if you actually look at it from more political terms you, it would be like the third world countries how do they think what are their perspectives what are their struggles and uh, what whatever they're going through so uh, my okay so what I what I would like to know is. Uh, uh, wh when can we reach the stage where all, like the, almost the whole of humanity can start to understand each other or you could say uh, there is a level of uh, consciousness, human consciousness where we can, you know, start to uh, you know, feel, uh, feel each other's vibrations because at this point of time if you actually uh, go to the news or if you actually go to the, uh, you know, whatever you see on the headlines or on the, on the whatever on TV, you can only see, uh, you can only see people uh, shouting or screaming or you know just express just uh, saying certain things you don't actually see uh, you don't really see a point or you don't really see an equi equilibrium where people are uh, understanding each other you don't see that level of human consciousness so where, uh, what do you all feel about it are we reaching that stage of human consciousness or, uh, or what can we do to reach that stage of human consciousness where we can actually understand each other challenging question <laughs> Museum, though. <laughs> okay. um, you know, I've been thinking hard about this question, and it's very interesting when we think about the 19th century. The sciences that defined knowledge was really the, you know, the birth of the physical sciences and the kind of transference into the biological sciences. There's a term that was phrased, uh, that was coined then, called consilience of inductions, and basically this meant when knowledge jumps from one field to another, it produces a surprise and then produces a condition that other knowledges kind of follow suit. So I've been suggesting that perhaps what we need is another moment of a consilience of inductions in which the aesthetic and the humanistic disciplines and inquiries begin to define the kind of parameters. So for knowledge to jump the other way, if you like, and to figure out you know, whether another version of the university and its publics might give us a, a, a different handle on the kind of planetary crisis that, that, that we, we're grappling with. So something needs to shift in the kind of ambit of the university and its publics for us to get to that question. I don't have a, be, a better answer to that, but I think there's work to be done. I'd like to add something. Um, I have not been thinking about it as you have and don't have, you know, conciliatory inductions is, is also an invitation I accept. What I want to offer is something from feminist theory about the idea of 
you know, it's not identity that sutures us, you know, in our sameness to one another. So Khalil and I, for example, are not connected because we're both Palestinian. But instead, what might actually bridge us are, are, different, are different coordinates of experience that also includes the political. And oftentimes, it's not, oftentimes we arrive at the humane and the humanistic through struggle together. So that that concept of our, you know, sameness, our shared humanity, isn't something that precedes our collaboration, but actually produced through it. So here is a complete, you know, plug for, uh, for struggle and struggling with one another which is actually a pathway to produce that, that outcome. Okay. In the middle. Hello, my name is Sara. I'm a student at NYU Abu Dhabi. Um, and my question is specifically for Professor Nura, but everyone's welcome to answer. Um, I've been trying to deal with this question for a while. Um, with reference to decolonial approaches to liberation, how do we strategically yet critically deal with the apartheid reports that are being released by organizations like B'Tselem. Because unfortunately, they are frequently the reason that people even turn their heads to the injustice that is in Palestine. But obviously there are, as you mentioned, a lot of small details that, such as deeming apartheid as something non-racist that exist within these reports. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's an excellent I, I was attacked by young Palestinians as a liberal Zionist because I posted the, apart the Amnesty International apartheid report. And young Palestinians were mad at me for being, and, and accused me of being a liberal Zionist. I think specifically because of this nuance that you're touching on, right? How is it, can we approximate the politics of hope in the words of Dr. Shireen Sayali, right? At the same time that we, you know, continue, that we don't forego our cynicism. And I think that that's, that's the work before us. We have to be able to be nuanced. And so much of what we've inherited in terms of this anti-colonial, anti-imperial frameworks that continue to be very salient in Palestine don't allow us that nuance, right? There becomes a line that's drawn. You're on one side of the line or the other. And if you're on the wrong side of the line, you're just part of the problem. So hence, support for the Amnesty International report can then make, make you a sellout. Even though we are so happy that Amnesty finally came around. We've actually been doing that work. We've been lobbying, you know, it's many, to, who they hire as staffers, when they go to Palestine, who they interview, who are its board of directors. This is the result of struggle, right? And so there is no easy answer except to be able to hold, I think, a lot of that complexity, to be able to speak simultaneously we applaud this, we support you, thank you, right? And at the same time, this is how this is going to be, catapult us into the discussion we need to have, which is a discussion that continues to grapple with the colonial dimension and the absolutely racist dimension. Thank you. Uh, yes? Oh, okay. We'll do it and then we're gonna get Go thank ahead. You. Thank you so much. Uh, Nora, I had a question for you um, as well. Hi. Um, so I agree with you 100% because I work within the law as well about the almost like the, the double-edged sword of like the law and international law where it's a tool of oppression and the oppressors, but at the same time it has this emancipatory potential, right? We can say that. Um, but at the same time, do you think, uh, or you know, it kind of goes back to the whole Human Rights Watch report, Amnesty International report, that it, we, we have to rely on these frameworks in order to legitimize this struggle. Um, and in that sense, it's a good thing because then you, you have this like the, the, the veneer of like neutrality of the law. So we're gonna go back to the law, but at the same time, we get stuck in the details. So like, for example, Israel saying, well, there is nobody on this land and therefore, you know, we can, we can do this or we can do that. Or, you know, uh, Resolution 194 is not even binding and it doesn't say the right to return, right? So how do we kind of get past that where like we're relying on the law to, um, I mean, not relying, but like in a sense publicly to legitimize kind of certain things, but at the same time, we're constrained by it as well. 
a legal thinker in this nuance, and, and you could probably cite the footnote in, <laughs> right, in, in 194, and specifically, what is it? Subsection 11, right? Yeah, I know. Uh, so how do, we, um, how do we deal with that? You know, one of the ways that I, that's my question, right? I became a lawyer because I thought, I was the young, you know, I was like the, every young person, I want a free Palestine, and we'll take it to court, right? And so um, I, we found, I found time and time and time again even when we served, we served two Israeli generals in U.S. federal courts for war crimes under the Alien Tort Statute. I mean, when we served Moshe Alon, who was responsible for the 1996 aerial bombardment of a UN compound in Qana in the south of Lebanon, it was the most joyous moment of my life, right? I thought we got him, right? Only to find that those cases were summarily dismissed on non-justiciable grounds, legal arguments that most common people wouldn't even understand, right? It was that that drove me to think about, well, how do we then understand the relationship between law and power? My own, you know, journey to answer that question, I arrived at the fact that it's actually, law is politics, right? And law, we shall not ever, do not ever be loyal, loyal to law. I think it's so ironic people call me a human rights lawyer. I call myself a human rights lawyer, but it's like so ironic because I'm not loyal to it. Law will yield to political power, including people power. And so in the moments that the law was the most useful for our emancipation is in fact when there was um, when there was solidarity amongst the Global South that became an automatic majority at the General Assembly, right? That actually legislated law that gave the right to gor for guerrillas to fight and be recognized as soldiers and not as terrorists, right? But the law then changes, right? And so there is no, we cannot be loyal to the law as a framework, but must use it strategically. And we have to be mindful. You know, it's, um, it's, it just goes back to that saying, turn your enemies' weak, uh, strengths into weaknesses and our weaknesses into strengths, and all of that is going to be contingent historically on a political moment, on the balance of power. And so I would say, you know, you have, we have to study when it's appropriate to use the law and when we actually have to fight against the law. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Nora. Uh, did you want to, yes, uh, Ali and then? Ilian, thank you. I, uh, while speaking Arabic, maybe I express more. So, uh, excuse me. كيف يمكن النظر إلى عقلية الاستعمار والاحتلال الاستيطاني من خلال النماذج الثلاث يعني جزء من تاريخ جنوب أفريقيا والأبارتايد والجدار الفصل العنصري الذي بناه الاحتلال الإسرائيلي وقطع الحياة الفلسطينية وكل الأرض وكل التفاصيل والجانب الثالث أو النموذج الثالث هو ما يسمى أو ما يطلق عليه المحميات البشرية وهذا يعني عار حقيقي في مناطق الشعوب الأصلية وليس السكان لأنه يروج أحيانا كلمة السكان الأصليين وهم شعوب أمم وليس مجرد سكان لا رابط بينهم ثقافي وتراث وتاريخ عميق فبالتالي هذه النماذج الثلاث كيف ننظر إلى عقلية المستعمر الاستيطاني شكرا do an, a, quite a disservice to this translation, but if I were to summarize, it's about how do we understand uh, the position uh, or, or the perspective of settler colonialism if we take into account you know, three different case studies of South African apartheid, of the apartheid wall in Palestine, as well as um, the treatment um, and, and the massacres of indigenous peoples who are referred to as populations rather than peoples which denies them Right, which denies them their, their nationhood and therefore their rights under right, whatever associated rights they may have. Is that okay? Um, and so, I, I mean, my answer to that is to, I think, the way that I would think through it is also not based on anything static, but instead something that would be quite dynamic and thinking what, what are those things 
that would bridge these experiences for an indigenous people. So rather than thinking about the settler in particular and what the settler is accruing from these violences, instead to think about what are these indigenous peoples, how are, how are they responding in this moment to their conditions? And so here, again, looking at, I think, recent forms of resistance that are not responsive to the settler in particular, and instead not always being in the shadow, for example, of oppression, but looking inward to think about um, what is it that we cultivate for one another in a space outside of that shadow which I would say is a bit of a decolonial approach. This is how I would, I would like to think about it, uh, which is quite empowering, right? It creates something for us um, where we're more concerned with ourselves and we're more concerned with, with the legacies that we leave behind rather than just being reactive and responsive. Also, if uh, I may, uh, uh, what, what comes to mind immediately is uh, this, uh, Outbursts in Sheikh Jarrah, for instance. I mean, just look at what these. She's a neighborhood in Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, these people are just like taking it in their own hands, and they started. And uh, how now uh, the occupation is uh, changing the narrative for that, you know. And uh, but uh, I mean, I, mean, I think uh, the outburst in Sheikh Jarrah that is continuing. Uh, con on a daily basis. And I think this is something uh, that uh, should be encouraged, you know, and should be supported. Uh, I mean, I don't know if uh, Nura probably knows more about this daily thing there. She says, <laughs> there, but, <laughs> but, you know, in terms of the, the legal or uh, uh, the uh, political aspect, I'm not the person to, uh, to, to probably advise about that or uh, maybe comment much about it. I think uh, Noura, I mean, we've all been uh, waiting a lot <laughs> to hear from her. I mean, she's, uh, she's really very uh, you know, uh, knowledgeable about these things. So, uh, yeah, sure. Thank you. So we had a last question, I think, somewhere. Yes, please. of things. Now I run a museum in the United States of America, and I have just also come from the Cape Town Art Fair, and I'm, I'm very, um, I guess, aware of the persistent racism in South Africa, despite um, the um, elimination of the legal framework of apartheid 28 years ago. And I think that there are lessons in that that I think we really have to share with the world. And I guess really, Pramesh, I'm, I'm addressing you in this. I, I, I'm a firm believer in the power of the arts to address some of these inequalities, but I'm also highly aware that the arts is entirely funded pretty much in South Africa by white capital. All the galleries are owned by white people. All the other money is supported by the Goethe Institute or the French or the British or the Swiss. There is no money. The anti-apartheid movement did an incredible job in resisting through civil society and through the arts. That doesn't exist anymore. All we have is a continuous number of exhibitions talking about the anti-apartheid movement. It is not a useful framework anymore when we think of 28 years beyond what happened when we destroyed that legal framework. And I think that for the state of Palestine and for our conversations between South Africa and Palestine, we have to go beyond apartheid. Absolutely, we have to recognize the ridiculous legal framework that's in place to justify the subjugation of the Palestinian people by the state of Israel and the international community and human rights instrumentation. I am 100% for that, of course. But we also have the advantage in South Africa to look at 28 years after that has effectively happened. And we have a shit show. Um, and I, I know this is being recorded, but for me, I, you know, I guess it's all my frustration <laughs> after seeing that we need to look at those 28 years and look at what happened 
after we defeated the legal framework that kept apartheid in place. And I agree that there is regeneration in the arts, and I'll be talking about that tomorrow. But we have to look very carefully and also very critically at what the arts and music and visual arts, who's funding it, how artists are making their livelihood, who's able to express themselves, and how in that there can be transnational lessons of, of solidarity. So that's, I guess, my comment, not really a yeah. question, but please do respond. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I think you want to respond, Permission? Yeah, it's a great, great comment. Um, you know, look, I, I said, I suppose the point I'm making is not to presume race, and I'm thinking here about Stuart Hall's incredible lecture in 1997, you know, on race as slippery signifier or fl floating signifier. And I know there have been lots of criticism with, about Stuart Hall's use of that formulation, but there is a way in which, you know, we have presumed in South Africa that apartheid and race are synonymous without thinking what discourse of race is being kind of manifested in these multiple levels at which it functioned, both in the everyday and beyond, you know, and it's kind of broad, big infrastructure. Um, so the point here is, you know, to mark race as that predicament of the slide into mechanized forms of life. And to try and figure out a struggle against that slide into mechanized forms of life. And I think that the aesthetic traditions of 19th century Europe failed in this respect. They surrendered that ground to the kind of overdetermination of a kind of proliferating overconfident science in that moment. And I think that what I'm arguing for is in the wake of apartheid, and I mean wake in both sense of the, of the word, both its death and its aftermath, to kind of figure out how we might reconfigure a relationship to the problematic of race, to think about the problem of its problematization again, because its accretion, its returns, are going to be infinite. As Derrida once put it, you know, in that essay, Racism's Last Word, which was an opening of an exhibition called Art Contra Apartheid, this was the last of many to come. Well, on that note, I think we'll end. Thank you so much, Noura, Permish, and Khalil, for a beautiful panel. Thank you all for coming, and please join us later and tomorrow for more amazing panels and talks, and Khalil's exhibit. Thank you.